Today is January 5th, Friday, January 5th. If you are watching this video, it's because you were absent. And um, I'm going to tell you, it's this is going to be a little bit challenging because I need to give you all the notes that you missed. It's a 47-minute class. We talked about things for 47 minutes. So this video might be a little bit long. You're expected to know everything that's in this video and be able to fill out your notes. Um, I would not just skip ahead and fill in the, the boxes because you're not going to have any idea what we're talking about. It's important that you listen to the lecture and you understand the context and the things that I tell you, okay? That being said, when you are finished, there is a homework assignment in today's folder in Schoology. It's called the Summary of the First Three Atomic Theories. If you were gone yesterday, you need to make sure and go back to yesterday's folder, watch the video, get the notes on Democritus. And then the notes today are going to be over the next two theories. You're going to use the, um, let me go there. You're going to use this paper here, and this is a digital copy, so you just download it, put it in, in um, good notes. But I'm going to have you write the theory number down. So we've got one, two, three, the name of the person that introduced the theory, the name of the theory itself, and then a summary of what that theory was or um, a, a picture of the model or whatever, okay? This is just so that you are studying um, and that I know that you are understanding the different theories. Eventually, we'll have six, and if you wait to study all six of them at the very end, right before the test, it's going to get very confusing for you. So this will be due for you when you come back to school. I'm going to ask you, do you have this? And um, if you don't, then um, it's going to be late. So please make sure that you are, um, that you're caught up and that you're ready to go when you come back to school. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk. Yesterday, we talked about Democritus, and I'm just going to go back a couple slides. Um, again, if you, if you are not understanding Democritus because you didn't watch the video yesterday, please watch the video. But just as a review, Democritus thought that atoms were of different materials looked like those materials. They were just smaller sizes. Um, he said that they were small and they were indivisible, uh, which is why he called them atomos, because atomos means indivisible. You can't break it down any farther. Um, so then today we're going to talk about John Dalton and then J.J. Thompson. Take a look at the timeline here. Look at how much time passed between Democritus's idea of the Atomos theory and John Dalton's billiard ball model. A lot of time passed. And again, we talked yesterday about the reason why so much time passed wasn't because nobody was really thinking about the atoms. It was more because they didn't have the technology available to test their theories or test their hypotheses about the, um, the atom. So in 1803, John Dalton started thinking about this idea called conservation of matter. And uh, conservation of matter was kind of a hot topic back then. And John Dalton wanted to argue for it. He said, this is a true scientific concept. And he wanted to use a better model of atoms. Um, and so he came up with his own called the billiard ball model. Uh, actually, let me go back here real quick. Remember, a billiard ball is like today we play pool and you've got pool balls. And so they're spherical. They're, they're super heavy because they're really dense. Um, and they all are, I know that they're different stripes and solids, but John Dalton back then just had solids. The billiards were solids. They didn't have the stripes. And so do you see that just round dot? A lot of you guys, um, when I asked at the very beginning of the notes, I had you guys draw a picture of what you thought an atom looked like. And a lot of people just drew a picture of a circle that was colored in. Basically, you just drew a model using Dalton's billiard ball model. Well, let's talk about this a little bit. So he was an English scientist, and he hypothesized that the law of conservation of matter could be explained using the idea of atoms. So his purpose was not really to clarify atoms. Uh, he didn't want to, he didn't really add anything to the atomic theory so much as he changed the model of what an atom, a beneficial model of an atom. Um, so the conservation of matter is this. 
It says, during a chemical reaction, matter is never created and it's never destroyed. What that means is, during a chemical reaction, the, the item that undergoes the chemical reaction is made up of atoms of specific different kinds of elements. For example, I've got a picture of marshmallows here, roasting. A marshmallow is made out of sugar and it's made out of the elements carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. When you add fire to that, you are causing a chemical change, which means you are breaking the bonds that are holding the carbon, hydrogen, and, add, and oxygen in, in the way that they're formed. You're breaking those bonds and they're rearranging to form new things. The black part of the marshmallow that gets burnt is no longer technically sugar, it's something else. But proponents of the conservation of matter law were saying that these were things that just kind of came from nowhere and or parts of the marshmallow atoms just sort of left, right? And that's not what happens. So John Dalton needed a better model. Um, let's dive into the conservation of matter real quick. You guys may know that um, plants need carbon dioxide and they need water and sunlight in order to grow, right? But what you may not understand and, and maybe not have pieced together is the reason why they need carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight is because it undergoes a chemical reaction called photosynthesis. And this is the chemical formula for photosynthesis. What it says is we take carbon dioxide and water and we add energy through sunlight in order to create sugar, which feeds the plant, and then oxygen that is a byproduct that the plant doesn't need and the plant releases that into the atmosphere. And so what John Dalton said is he's trying to show that, that matter is never created and it's never destroyed. So that means however many number of atoms I have of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen on the left side of that arrow, which is the, the beginning of the chemical reaction, is going to be the same as what's on the right side. And that's the end of the chemical reaction. So the bonds that bond, uh, that join carbon dioxide together break apart and the carbon and the oxygen molecules, atoms, rearrange with hydrogen and oxygen atoms from the water and they form new substances called sugar and oxygen. So the substances are new, but the number of atoms stays the same for both sides. So I'll explain this a little bit later when we go through our chemical reaction unit. Um, but basically what it says is if you look at the carbon dioxide, the big number six in front of the C tells me how many of those molecules, compounds I need. So I need six molecules of carbon dioxide. So I would say that there were six carbons in six molecules of carbon dioxide. You would take six times two to find out how many atoms or, or elements, how many atoms of oxygen I have. And so that's 12. And then going over to the water, I have six molecules of water. So six times two means total, I have 12 hydrogen atoms and six times one is six oxygen. So then that means all total on the left side, I have six carbon, 18 oxygen, and 12 hydrogen. Now, if you are freaked out and you have no idea what I just did, don't worry about it. Um, we're gonna review this again in, a, in about a month and a half or so, two months when we go through our chemical reaction unit. Well, all I want you to do here is just understand what conservation of matter is. After a chemical reaction, I have to have the same number of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen because it says it's never created and it's never destroyed. I don't all of a sudden have six carbon, go from six carbon to five carbon, and I don't just have like random sodium coming in here. If you look after the arrow, this is our product. 
we have one molecule of glucose or sugar and you can see that I have six carbon, 12 hydrogen and six oxygen. And then I have this leftover oxygen that the plant doesn't need. It's six molecules of O2. And so six times two is 12. And so you'll see that John Dalton proves conservation of matter through a, a chemical formula like this. But this was hard for people to really understand. Uh, and so he said, okay, here's what I need. I need a better model. I need a model of atoms in which I can show that they're all the same. They're round, spherical, they're the same size, same density, but the different elements, I'm gonna use different colors to show that they're different. He wasn't really, he never really said anything about why he thought they were different. He just knew they were different. And again, the reason why they knew they were different is because Mendeleev has already put together uh, the periodic table of elements and we can see that they're different. Okay, so he says that every single atom of an element, such as gold, is the same as every other atom of that element. So look down below this box. See how I have carbon as a white circle and oxygen is red and hydrogen is gray. So what John Dalton is saying is that every single atom of carbon would be exactly the same. And so he needed to model that in some way so they were all one color. But then we've got different atoms of different elements. And even though they're the same size and shape, which is different than what Democritus said. Remember, Democritus said that there's different sizes and shapes of atoms. Dalton says, no, 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 no. They're all the same size. They're all the same shape. They're all basically dense spheres, but they have different properties, different characteristics. And so we have to say that they're different somehow. So I'm going to show that difference by using a different color. He also said that the atoms can combine in different ways. And so the grouping of atoms that I have on the right side there underneath the box shows one oxygen and two hydrogen. This is a water molecule because it has H2, two hydrogens and one oxygen. Okay, he says, um, Mm, I'm just going to let you read through that and pull up the information that you need. I'm going to move on. All right, so he finalized this billiard ball model in 1807 and published it. And he said, picture the, the atom as this. It is tiny and indivisible, which is exactly what uh, Dem Democritus said. But then Dalton said further... They're uniformly dense, so they're no longer different sizes and different shapes. They're exactly the same, and they are solid sphere, that there was no space in there. They were solid. So again, think of that billiard ball. It's going to be a really heavy, dense, round, and, and that's what he thought um, an atom was. And the only way that he could show that they were different is by using different colors to represent that each element is different, okay? So that right there, that red circle, that's a billiard ball model. Dalton hypothesized that atoms were identical for each element, but different from atoms of other elements. And essentially, he thought atoms were featureless spheres, all with the same density. Um, I want you to put a big giant uh, star. I'm going to try and add something here. I'm going to insert a shape and I'm going to go, can I get a star? Can I get a star? Uh, meh. Shoot, where are my stars? Well, you know what? I'll do this. And I want it, oh, dug on it. I'm getting rid of that. I want it right here. I'm going to insert an image. Let's go to now insert its shape. Sorry, you guys. You probably see a star. I don't. So I'm just going to use, where did I find that? This right here. I want you guys to mark this. This is the important thing um, that I want you to remember. This is when you go to uh, summarize Dalton's model or his theory, this is what I want you to restate. 
the atoms, all atoms, are identical. And you may even want to say that they're identical because, look right here, they're tiny, indivisible, uniformly dense, solid spheres. It looks like this, that's that red circle. Uh, okay, let's continue on. And we're going to go to your check for understanding. So on your page, you just have a white space. This is what I want you to do. I want you to draw a billiard ball model of an element called sodium. And I'm going to tell you that sodium, let's make him blue. Okay? So pause the video and I want you to do that. If you need to go back and look at your notes to find out, like, well, how am I supposed to draw this? Go back and do that. But I'm going to tell you I want you to use the color blue and you're using the billiard ball model. Next, I want you to draw another atom of a different element. And so this is how I'm checking for your understanding. What did Dalton say? If an element is different than another one, how did he represent that? Okay, when you're ready, continue on. Okay, so it's important for you to remember that back in the 1800s, they are really starting to understand uh, different concepts and different parts of our natural world. Uh, remember, electricity is, is up and going. Um, Thomas Edison, uh, Tesla have all been experimenting with electricity. People understand charges. And so they understood that like charges repel and, and opposite charges attract. Um, in class, I gave the kids some magnets and I said, magnets are not electrically charged, but they're good models for us to understand this. So if you can imagine holding magnets, if I have magnets that um, are, they've got the same pole facing each other, you know that they've got that repelling. It, it doesn't allow you to put it together. And the only time a magnet will connect with another magnet is if they are opposite poles. And so it's exactly the same thing with charges. Positive charges repel positive charges. Negative charges repel negative charges. Opposite charges will actually attract. And so it's important to understand that when we get to our next scientist. His name is J.J. Thompson, and he has this idea called uh, a plum pudding model. And look right next to Thompson there. You're going to see it looks almost like a chocolate chip cookie. Um, and he's got some uh, plus signs and minus signs, negative signs in, in these structures. If you were looking at that figure, it looks like the cookie part of the chocolate chip cookie is positive and the chocolate chips themselves would be negative. This is important for you to understand so that you can kind of understand what he was saying. Look at the timeline that has passed. We've got almost, we've got over a hundred years that have passed from John Dalton's model to J.J. Thompson's. Again, there are some advancements in science, but they're slow going, but it's much faster than what it was between Democritus and John Dalton. All right, let's find out what Thompson says about atoms. So J.J. Thompson was an English scientist, and he conducted experiments using something called a cathode ray tube, and there's a picture of it right there to the right. Um, the cathode ray is made out of glass, and it's a vacuum inside the glass. There's no air at all. All the air has been sucked out and then it's been sealed shut. So there's nothing inside, okay? If you can zoom in uh, on that third kind of bump in the very center, you're gonna see two plates. There's a plate on the top and a plate on the bottom. Take a look down here. The plate at the bottom was negatively charged and the plate at the top was positively charged. J.J. Thompson, through his experiments, was the first person to identify that there was negatively charged subatomic particles in an atom, and he named them electrons. Before that, 
Remember, everybody thought that atoms were solid, that they were nothing else inside of it. Um, and Thompson is the one that says, wait a second, there are things inside the atom and they're called electrons. Let me explain how he did that. So looking at this diagram of the cathode ray, you see on the left side where there's this box that says high voltage. So he had some kind of energy source, power source, and that, that moved um, electricity, if you will, through this vacuum glass tube. An invisible ray was supposed to pass through the tube and at the end of the ray where it hit, um, it's, see where it says anode and there's that little kind of pad at the end of the, the glass tube. He was expecting that to glow where that ray was hitting and he was expecting it to be straight line straight across. And what he noticed was it actually glowed red at the top of that tube, which means the beam of, of electricity or the beam of light that was invisible actually bent. And he knew enough about electric charges to know that like charges repel and opposite charges attract. And so as that ray was passing through those two plates, the negative charge on the bottom plate repelled it and pushed it up. And at the same time, the positive charge on the top plate attracted it, which further pushed it up. And so this beam was bent. And that's what he realized that there had to be the only, the only way that that could happen is if in those particles of the ray, which were invisible, there had to be electrons. They had to be something that was a negative charge. He called them electrons. This is fascinating that, that basically understanding the reaction that happened in a, in a, an experiment, um, was a result of things that you can't even see. That's fascinating. Okay, so let's work it out. This is a picture of plum pudding, okay? I don't want you to, to feel like you have to draw this cut out version because it's kind of hard to draw. Look up in the corners in the top left and the top right corner. That's more of the model that I want you to draw. I want you to draw a model that is uh, circular. I want you to show that there's um, some positive and negative in there. Uh, and plum pudding is the name of an English dessert. And basically it's like a cake and or like a like a really thick custard kind of pudding, cake, cakey pudding kind of, whatever. And it's it had these pieces of fruit that were dried fruit and they put that in there and it's called plum pudding. Very similar to maybe a, a blueberry muffin. I like the idea of a chocolate chip cookie instead because we can see that in those models up there in the top right and the top left. So here's what Thompson said. He reasoned that there had to be a source of positive charge within the atom to counterbalance that negative charge on the electron because remember, like charges repel. So if he was sitting there thinking about it, and he goes, okay, I know there's electric charges in there that are negative. If he said an atom was made up only of negative charges, that wouldn't make any sense because the atom itself wouldn't be able to stay together because those particles would repel each other. So he knew that there had to be some positive charge in there as well to counterbalance that negative charge. And so what he came up with is this idea that the, the cakey batter part or the cookie dough part would be positively charged. And then the pieces inside of that, the chocolate chips or the, the little pieces of fruit, that was the negatively charged electron. And so this led Thompson to propose that atoms could be described as negative particles floating within a positively charged area. This is what I want you guys to remember. Uh, I'm going to add. I'm going to add that little cute little thing right here. This is the part of the. Um, oh boy. 
the part of his theory that I want you to be able to restate when you're doing your summary, um, that there is this positive charged matter or cookie dough. And then within that, we've got pieces of negatively charged particles. Those are called the electrons. Okay, that's it. The check for understanding here is in your own words, what did J.J. Thompson think atoms look like? And I want you to include a drawing in your explanation. If you're frustrated, if you're not quite sure, come on back to this slide. Look at that box that we marked. That's what he thought atoms look like. And remember, this right here in the top left and in the top right. Oh my, what did I do? In the top left and the top right, that's what he thought uh, would make a good model. Yes, right here. Okay? So when you're finished with your check for understanding, make sure that you do the homework where you are writing out the theory number one, number two, number three. Let me go over this with you real quick. So number one was Democritus. The name of the theory is the Atomos theory. And then you have to go back in your notes and tell me what did Democritus think an atom look like. And if you want to include a couple examples of those models, you sure can. Next, we have J.J. Dalton. Not J.J. Dalton. John Dalton. So number two would be John Dalton. The name of the theory is the billiard ball model. You're going to tell me what he thought an atom looked like and um, finish filling out your chart for that. Lastly, number three is J.J. Thompson, the plum pudding model. And again, summarize. What did he think an atom looked like? And you can include a picture of the model as well. All right. I hope to see you on Monday.